Good morning. My name is Sister Justin Timmeriam. I am presently stationed here at Our Lady of Chesterhova Parish. And this is in North Tonawanda, New York. And we've had a very, there's three of us sisters who have just come here this past month. And um, we've had a very warm welcoming. And it's my joy to try to bring a program called Coffee with Sister Jacinta. And I have to say it's cheated because there's a priest somewhere in the United States doing coffee with, I think there's Father Gary. Um, but whatever his name was, uh, thanks for the inspiration. I think he was doing a daily reflection on the readings um, of the Mass each day. What I thought I would do is do a reflection after reading um, on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This past summer, realizing I was going to be stationed here, I was looking at different things that may be of um, interest to people. And I know one that was of interest to me uh, to present was the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And this book had it written, I don't know if we can get it lined up nicely to be able to see, but anyways, 365 um, days to a deeper faith. And, um, and what it did is it took the Catechism of the Catholic Church and it broke it into 365 days to be able to read through the entire Catechism. So we will not have 365 days, at least in one year, but this program for an entire year, because I'm only doing three days a week. But um, we'll see if we can cover more than one day during a session. And I would like to be able to do the presentation and then afterwards, anyone who might have a question, uh, we could see if we can look at those near the end. Um, and I'm not necessarily do this to be a scholarly um, type of study. I'm more in trying to especially deepen our spiritual life and our faith should bring us to a deeper relationship with Christ and especially by imitating and also by applying those teachings. And we know that they're not always easy to apply. Uh, sometimes they demand sacrifices or to go against uh, things of our culture of today. So um, I hope that this presentation will be one that can bring us all closer to doing that imitation of our Lord. And uh, we'll begin today with prayer. And I know that um, there's, a, there's a beautiful Nicene Creed, there's also the Apostles' Creed, but there's also what one that's called the Act of Faith. So um, let's begin with that today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O oh my God, I firmly believe that you are one God in three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that your divine Son became man, died for our sins, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches, because you have revealed them, who can neither deceive nor be deceived. Our Lady, uh, Mother of Sorrows, um, this feast day we celebrate this day, we ask you to be with us and to open our hearts to an ever greater love of our Lord and a greater faithfulness to his will in our lives. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so I am going to dive right into reading where the person who put this outline together of the 365 days to go through the catechism um, has a start, and that's in the prologue of the catechism. And it begins with, Father, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved than the name of Jesus. The life of man to know and love God. God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. 
he calls together all men scattered and divided by sin into the unity of his family, the church. To accomplish this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son as redeemer and savior. In his son and through him, he invites men to become in the Holy Spirit, his adopted children and thus heirs of his blessed life. And um, I, I can't wait till I finish reading to be able to get comments. So I'm just gonna get comments as we go along here. And I just wanna mention, I forgot to mention, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, um, for some, it, it can be a little frustrating if we are going to it the way that sometimes Americans like to do things because we have a question, we want an answer. And, um, but the catechism, if I like it to a dictionary, a dictionary might give us a definition, okay, of um, a word. But if you go to encyclopedia, okay, it gives you a history and a background for that particular um, thing, word that you're looking up. Okay, so the Catechism of the Catholic Church, maybe I'd liken it in comparison to the Baltimore Catechism. The Baltimore Catechism is getting right at a definition, right at an answer, okay? Um, it's like going to a dictionary, getting the definition for a word, all right? But then if you go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it's like a development of your faith. And so it's not going to have succinct answers. Um, so that may help you. If you're really looking for um, a fast answer to something, you probably want to go to more of a Baltimore Catechism, even the Council of Trent Catechism. Um, there's a catechism written by Pope um, Pius X. There's a number of catechisms out there. Um, so those would be more ones that you would look at for a fast answer to something. Again, this one is more a development of our faith. And um, I have to say, I, I can really, really come to appreciate how much work went into this, trying to bring in all the different teachings of saints throughout these 2000 years, also relying heavily on the scripture and applying it in so many different areas as we go along. So it is very, very beautiful, um, but it's just a different approach than sometimes we're expecting when we go to uh, a catechism. So on this one, we, we come up with that first sentence, okay, the first paragraph, where it says that God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. And I think that sometimes we don't get taught this, that um, God made us out of sheer love. He had no need, you know, and um, sometimes that's really hard to accept. Um, but that's how important we are. That's how much um, God is in love with us. He wants us to be able to be able to uh, know that we don't have to do anything to be able to be loved by Him, except accept His love and accept the life that He wants for us. And and then and yet at the same time, He's going to share His sonship with us. Okay, um, He doesn't just make us okay. Um, but by taking on manhood in the incarnation, he, he, he actually united mankind with himself so that he could present all of us as, as, as one with him, as sons of God, okay? Um, um, we can call ourselves daughters and sons. They can call God the Father, Abba, um, or Father. But it's because Christ is willing to share that nature with us. So he united our human nature with divine nature and allowed us to be able to be considered uh, children of God. And so it's totally out of gratuitousness. And that is um, like, if you ever read St. John's uh, letter, you know, God loved us first. You know, it wasn't us who loved him first. And being able to receive that again and again is, is a very powerful and very beautiful um, reality. The number, number two says, so that this call should resound throughout the world, Christ sent forth the apostles that he had chosen, commissioning them to proclaim the gospel. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. 
Strengthened by this mission, the apostles went forth and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that attended it. And I think, again, it was strengthened. They were strengthened by this mission, okay? Um, knowing that they're children of God, there's a new strength. We don't have to depend on ourselves. And I think about that even beginning this program. Um, you know, I get butterflies in my stomach just thinking about um, doing this particular Zoom. And I've never done a video recording before. Um, and, you know, so it can be intimidating. It's sort of nice. I used to do the Radio Maria and I could hide. No one had to see me. They could just listen to me. And um, <laughs> now <laughs> it's a little bit more embarrassing. But um, so, uh, but, you know, it, but we, we wait on the Holy Spirit. And we count on him to be able to give us uh, the ability um, to uh, work through um, through us, you know, and and not depending on us. And, and that gives us like a great a great deal of freedom. So I'm just going to mention to those of you who are just coming in, um, if you could just if you can just mute yourself, okay, and, and then at the close we'll have an open time for discussion. And that works really, really well. Okay. Um, all right. So now we're, we're going to paragraph three in the catechism. So if you have a catechism, if you want to join in reading that uh, along with me, that'd be fine. Um, if not, you could just listen as I read. I did mention at the beginning of the program that my, my desire is not necessarily um, theology, although that's what we're basing it on, because but mine is spirituality, and, and a good spirituality has to be based on a knowledge of our faith. The greater that we know God and the truth that God gave us, the greater is our love. Um, it just is allowed to be able to increase, and we want to be able to correspond to the love of God and to that knowledge. Um, and even though sometimes it can be very difficult. Okay, in paragraph three, it says, those who, with God's help, have welcomed Christ's call and free to respond to it, are urged on by love of Christ to proclaim the good news everywhere in the world. This treasure received from the apostles has been faithfully guarded by their successors. All Christ's faithful are called to hand it on from generation to generation by professing the faith, by living it in fraternal sharing, and by celebrating it in liturgy and in prayer. And... I think that this is um, an area that is where a lot of times we can have um, a difficulty because we have to be really not to say I just believe it in my head or in my heart, but it's got to be actually shown in our words, in our thoughts, the way, the way we think often influences the things that we say and choose, the way we act. And um, so we just don't want it to be head knowledge because you know, even the devil believes in God, you know, um, he, he believes in all the truths of the Catholic church. Okay. But the fact of the matter is it can't save him. And so this idea of being able to, um, imitate him, um, and then to live it out and to be able to be a living gospel. Um, Christ wants us to be his hands, his eyes, his, his lips, his, his, um, compassion, um, and so it, it's a huge responsibility given not only to the apostles, but to the disciples. And that would be us. And he wishes us to be able to um, really be able to join him in proclaiming that good news. This was um, something that he commissioned to each one of us. And we have to do it where he has us. Uh, that could be just in our own home, just among um, the few that might be in our household. It could be that someone who's in a public office. Um, it could be someone who's working as a teacher. It could be someone just in their job and their faithfulness. Um, and it wouldn't make any difference what that job is. You know, whether it's being a secretary, whether it's being in charge of um, janitorial work, all of those matter, uh, depending on how we do things. If we do them without, if we're doing it for Christ, um, St. Paul says that we should never do anything just for man. Um, but we should, if we're doing it for Christ, then we're doing everything to the best um, that we can do it, because that's that's ultimately who we really are serving, and um, and it could be you know in the person of our boss, but to go beyond that and to be able to see that we're doing it above all for God and for His glory. In paragraph four, it says, 
this is under a title called Hand Thing on the Faith Catechesis. Quite early on, the name catechesis was given to the totality of the church's effort to make disciples, to help men believe that Jesus is the Son of God, so that believing they might have life in his name, and to educate and instruct them in this life, thus building up the body of Christ. Catechesis is an education in the faith, in the faith of children, of young people, and adults which includes especially the teaching of Christian doctrine imparted, generally speaking, in an organic and systematic way, with a view to initiating the hearers into the fullness of Christian life. And again, this is very helpful. What it mentions about it being um, organic and a systematic way, um, you know, whenever I start a class with um, CCD, I always have to go back to the very beginning um to, to original sin because what's the whole reason for christ and um and so if we know that he had to save us what is he saving us from or, or you know and so this is um something that um, well, yes such a beautiful you know, part. i think we had to always keep in mind um and 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 knowing <laughs> if we keep that focus that it, it's a whole explanation of um our faith as we go along and um, giving it a, an organized um, structure is more helpful. I remember if you ever heard, listen to- um, I'll say you must meet him. Immaculate. Um, Cynthia, uh, if you could just turn off your mic. <laughs> um, <laughs> oops, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, honey. <laughs> um, anyway, um, which she was, Immaculate was during the Rose Ray. She's from Rwanda. She was a survivor who um, has a beautiful book called Led by Faith. And um, but anyway, she was, uh, when she was during the Rose Ray, it was so cute because all, they were all supposed to get a test. And, and none of them could remember the mysteries. They had them all, all confused. They, and all of a sudden, she realized, oh, the mysteries are just a story that we all know. And she realized there was an order to the whole mystery. You know, there was an enunciation. Like as soon as Mary received that message, she learned about Elizabeth. And so she went to visit her. And then she herself was having a child. So there was a nativity. And 40 days later, she's going to present him, you know. And then we just have this hidden life of Christ. So then, you know, the next time we meet him, you know, he's, he's going to the temple. And then um, Mary loses him. And when she learned that, it was like, it was so cute. It was like a revelation. And she told all the other kids. And the, and the priest was astounded because everyone passed the test so beautifully, better than any other year. But it's because there was this um, story, there was a sequence, there was a, a, um, you know, a, a systematic way of learning the rosary. And so when we're talking about catechesis, sometimes that's really, really helpful when we have a systematic way. It doesn't always have to be. Sometimes we're just gonna go for a particular truth um, that we're unclear on, and that's absolutely fine. But um, sometimes when we want to be able to relate the faith, it's really helpful to start <laughs> to have a beginning point <laughs> and, and then carry that through. And uh, okay, so we're on number six paragraph and it says, while not being formally identified with them, catechesis is built on a certain number of elements of the church's pastoral mission, which have a catechetical, catechetical aspect that prepare for catechesis or spring from it. They are the initial proclamation of the gospel or missionary preaching to arouse faith, then the examination of reasons for the belief, experience of Christian living, the celebration of the sacraments, the integration into the ecclesial community, the apostolic and the missionary witness. And so um, here it gives us what would that look like, the organized way of actually going about learning the faith. And here it talks about, okay, again, um, you know, first of all, learning what the gospel is, okay? And then from there, why do we even need him? So there's an examination for the reason for belief and seeing that it's logical. It's not something just sentimental. And so often we have a tendency to, to think that. And, um, but there, you know, faith is, is, is very logical. Um, to believe the world exists just because it evolved with no one steering it would be illogical. You know, um, 
you can't have order. You can't have anything even moving if you don't have something moving it that didn't have to be moved. And that's how we define God. And, and so you, you see a logic behind our faith. It isn't something contrary to science or contrary to our, our ability to think. And um, so that's, that's really, really um, an important thing that the church continually um, is able to demonstrate in, in, in the truth that Christ, uh, that God has revealed to us. And then um, looking at the experience of Christian living and celebrating the sacraments, which is God's a gift, um, his life with us um, through the sacraments, especially the ones that we can receive often of confession and um, Holy Communion. And then experiencing also that ability to be a part of the church, I, recognizing that we have an obligation to help each other, um, again, through our witness, through our prayers, through our sacrifices, and then also um, being able to actively uh, participate in that. And again, that, that goes to, according to what God has given to each of us, because we're, we're all given different talents and different gifts and different obligations. And that can, again, it can just be through prayer. And, um, and it's not a just prayer, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Prayer is powerful. Prayer, um, they say, you know, it's, it's what changes the world. And Syriac, you know, there's more miracles brought by prayer than anyone dreams of. And um, I remember a story about a experiment they did in a hospital one time. There were people who were very, very sick who did not believe in God. They were just like checking off the religion, okay? And, and what they did was they had a group of people who were given the names of only like half of those, those um, patients and they prayed for them. And the other half were not given anyone to pray for them, okay? But all the patients themselves were not believing. The ones who had people praying for them, all of them got well faster and, and more thoroughly than the ones who didn't. And it was just showing the effect of prayer, you know? And again, this, it was just an experiment, okay? Um, and we're gonna say it was a fluke, but um, we really do see how often, you know, I, I know that I, I was going through a real hard trial one time and I could physically feel the prayers of someone praying for me. And, and assisting me to get over a difficulty. And it was just the neatest experience. And I know when my sister um, was dying of cancer, how many times she was just overwhelmed with this strength that she knew was being communicated through people praying for her. So um, there is a, a real power there. So it's not just prayer when I say just prayer, <laughs> you know, but I just mean like, we sometimes we always get caught up in the action, but sometimes God is giving us that ability to be active and, and the beautiful works that people do in our communities um, is, is something that just always, I marvel at. I just, when I said, I just came um, here to Tonawanda, um, in North North Tonawanda in um, New York and with the COVID, knowing that people couldn't be able to go to the um, food pantries and, and to the Vince de Paul or different outreaches for them, they came up. I mean, this is so beautiful. They have this, um, this extra little space beside a building, um, a room, and people drop off all kinds of goodies there, you know, whether they went to the store or whether it's clothing, and the poor know about it. And they're able to go in there and you see people coming in and, and getting food for their family. You see other people dropping off groceries. And um, so this inventiveness, okay, to be able to continue to assist those, okay, being missionaries in our own territory or whether we actually go out to other countries. Um, both are so important and both are given to us um, as the faithful. I'm going to start now, um, in the beginning of this program, I mentioned, um, this, I'm using the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and it was broken into 365 days, which I think is really um, a really neat way of doing this. I, I'm only doing this three times a week, so I'm going to see if I can get at least two days in uh, during a session. And I'm trying to keep an eye on my time also, so that if you have any questions or comments, um, we can do those. So day two, I'll see if I can get this part done. <laughs> okay, maybe I won't do as many commenting. Um, here it says in, in paragraph seven, catechesis is intimately bound up with the whole of the church's life, not only her geographical extension and numerical increase, 
but even more, her inner growth in the correspondence with God's plan depends essentially on catechesis. Periods of renewal in the church are also intense moments of catechesis. In the great era of the fathers of the church, saintly bishops devoted an important part of their ministry to catechesis. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, St. John Chrysostom, St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, and many other fathers wrote catechetical works that remain models for us. The ministry of catechesis draws ever fresh energy from the councils. The Council of Trent is a noteworthy example of this. It gave catechesis priority in its construction, in its constitution and decrees. It lies at the origin of the Roman Catechism, which is also known by the name of the Council, which is a work of the first rank as a summary of Christian teaching. The Council of Trent initiated a remarkable organization of Catholic catechesis. Thanks to the work of the holy bishops and theologians such as St. Peter Canisius, St. Charles Borromeo, St. Teridus of Montegroveo, and St. Robert Bellarmine, it occasioned the public publication of numerous catechisms. catechisms. And I, I want to mention, in the beginning of this program, I did mention, um, when we're working with the catechism of the Catholic Church, it's not like the Baltimore Catechism or like the catechism um, from Trent, the Roman catechism. Those are, are like a dictionary. If you're looking at a question or a subject and you need an answer, it's fantastic. You can go to it and you can find an answer. But the catechism of the Catholic Church is more like an encyclopedia. It's a development of our faith. It's an explanation. It tries to bring in, I mean, the whole wealth of 2,000 years. So sometimes you're going to get a whole little synthesis from um, different um, documents or from different saints of the church, different time periods, as well as scripture. Um, so if you're looking specifically for an answer to a question, typically the catechism of the Catholic Church will be a little bit more confusing. Um, it's this there, but it's, it's, it's really meant as a development. It's more like an encyclopedia compared to a dictionary. Um, so that might be helpful if you're, if you just, you know, like you can always use those other catechisms. They're, they don't go out of, <laughs> the truth remains the truth. Um, it's just a different way of presenting it. Okay, in number 10, it says, it is therefore no surprise that catechesis in the church has again attracted attention in the wake of the Second Vatican Council, which Pope Paul VI considered the great catechism of the modern church. The General Catechetical Directory, of 1971, the session of the Synod of Bishops devoted to evangelization in 1974, the Catechesis of 1977, the Apostolic Exhortation mm -hmm. Evangelii Nutandi um, in 1975, and the Catechesis Tredande um, of 1979 mm -hmm. attest to this. The Extraordinary Synod of Bishops in 1985 asked that a catechism or a compendium of all Catholic doctrine regarding both faith and morals be composed. The Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, made the synod's wish his own, acknowledging that this desire wholly corresponds to the real needs of the universal church and of the particular churches. He set in motion everything needed to carry out the synod father's wish. Okay, and, and that's really a beautiful way of um, saying what I was talking about. It's actually a whole compendium of the Catholic doctrine regarding both faith and morals. Um, so it's not exactly the kind of catechism that what we, many of us um, are acquainted to are called the Baltimore Catechism in the United States. Okay, two more paragraphs and then I'm going to close. Um, and this is under a title called The Aim and Intended Readership of This Catechism. And we are in the prologue of the catechism right now. This catechism, this catechism aims at presenting an organic synthesis of the essential and fundamental contents of the Catholic doctrine as regards both faith and morals in the light of the Second Vatican Council and the whole of the church's tradition. Its principal sources are the sacred scriptures, the fathers of the church, the liturgy, the church's magisterium. It is intended to serve as a point of reference for the catechisms, a compendia, that is composed in the various countries. This work is intended primarily for those responsible for catechesis. First of all, to the bishops as teachers of the faith and pastors of the church. 
is offered to them as an instrument in fulfilling their responsibility of teaching the people of God. Through the bishop, it is addressed to the redactors of the catechisms, the priests and the catechists. It will also be useful reading for all other Christian faithful. So we've done two days worth. And um, I think that it really is a, a great prologue uh, to help us understand what was the aim of writing this catechism. And I'm going to just say a closing prayer and then I'm going to end the recording and then we can talk if we, um, for anyone who would like to, okay? Because right now we're being recorded. So, um, Lord, we thank you for the uh, beautiful work and sacrifices of all the different saints throughout these 2,000 years who have testified, sometimes even to the point of giving their blood, to the truth that you have bequeathed to us. We ask you to help us to be faithful to those teachings in our everyday life, and we ask you to deepen our relationship with you through a greater imitation of you and a deeper prayer life. We ask this through the intercession of our Lady. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.